go. I just found out I was needed as a fill-in. And you're going to notice two things here. You're going to notice that, there we go. You're going to notice that we started a little late, but we should be good. This is going to be a little shorter version than I usually do of this because I usually have an hour, but we should be good. Um, helpful minion, wave your hand. This is my helpful minion, my 16-year-old Lucas. Um, he has reference cards for what I'm about to teach you guys. So if anybody wants a handy A5 memory jogger ref card that you can stick up by your computer at any time, wave your arm wildly and he will come bring you one or two. Okay, everybody wants them. Um, if you are a really, really astute observer and ask a good question, the first couple of people to ask good questions will also get a copy of our O'Reilly mini book, which helps you apply the principles in your work. And Luke, hold one of those up. Just hold one up all by itself so they can see how thin and short and easy to read it is. Because I have a pet peeve. Let me tell you, I, one of my favorite stunts that anyone has ever pulled because I love showmanship, and one of my coworkers, Craig Jackson, is a little bit of a showman, and he had to go talk to a Navy admiral about information security. So he printed up all of NIST 800 series, two-sided on the cheap copy paper we get at the university, and he didn't even put it in binders, he just put those ring things on it. And standing on a table, it's about this tall. And he said, sir, this is what the U.S. government expects an engineer to keep in their head every time they change a line of code. How well do you think that works? It's a real, yeah, exactly. It's a really good way to start a conversation about the way most information security is done with checklists and prescriptive regulation doesn't work terribly well. Because first of all, our world is dynamic, it changes. We get handed new technologies all the time. I literally get handed new technologies almost daily. Um, at the Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research at Indiana University, I specialize in securing weird things. Luke, hand out those cards. Um, hold on to the books, hand out the cards. There you go. And uh, so sometimes somebody comes to me and says, so we have these autonomous drones that go under the ocean and scan the bottom of the ocean, and one of them has been stolen by Somali pirates, and it still has crypto keys to get into my network. What do I do? Um, or, hey, I have a giant telescope installation on top of a volcano. How do I secure that? Anybody got a best practices list for giant volcano top telescopes anywhere? Yeah, I didn't think so. So my colleagues and I at IUCACR decided to say, how can we teach this to other people? Um, and I'm going to skip the backstory of how this all came to be because we have limited time, though it was a cool story, and get down to the seven principles that we came up with from which all other information security can be derived. And I mean, we went all the way back to the time of Sun Tzu and all the way forward to theoretical technologies that haven't actually been invented yet, and this works consistently across all of them. Another thing that's true about this is that it works up and down the stack. You can talk to the law and policy people who don't know any tech. You can talk to the people who are working in assembler code, doing very low level, very finicky things. You can talk to your ICS and SCADA people. You can talk to people doing web interfaces. The idea is to teach people a set of concepts that work together so that everyone at every part of the process is speaking the same language about information security and so that you can figure things out when you don't have a list. So you can diagnose how something went terribly wrong after it went terribly wrong. Or so when someone hands you a security best practices list, you can look at it and find out if the list is stupid and about to shoot you in the foot. So that's what this talk is about. Um, so I got a little bit ahead of myself, um, but across time and across roles, we went back into history, we went forward. Um, and I don't want security people to feel like they have to relearn everything every couple of years, let alone those of you who work with security, but whose primary job isn't security. Because a lot of times I talk to systems administrators, I talk to programmers, I talk to architects, who need to create things that are secure and need to maintain things in a secure way, but they're not security geeks. They can't 
constantly be relearning this. Um, and again, getting people of different roles to talk together. I've talked a little bit of death by checklists. I'm not going to belabor that. Again, we're a little pressed for time. But I am going to talk about where does information security come from? So whoever wrote that checklist thought it was good for something, right? There isn't just a magic incantation. I promise sacrificing goats does not make your stuff more secure. Um, sacrificing pigs does if it involves feeding me bacon and getting me to work on your stuff, however. Just so you know. Um, but these are just seven principles. So it's really easy to work with because you can keep this forever and carry it with you. And I really do mean just seven things. Um, for those of you who are not into birds, this is a magpie. Every time a magpie sees something small and shiny, they collect it. So if you ever see a magpie nest, it just has like buttons and coins that they've stolen or shiny little pieces of river rocks just all adorning their nest. They're really into small shiny things and collecting them even though they have no use whatsoever. That's how a lot of people do information security. They go out to where the vendors are and they look for whoever has the slickest marketing material and they say, that that's what I'm spending my money on this quarter. And then they add another thing and they expect to be secure instead of making very strategic choices and actually being as secure as they can be with the resources that they have. So seven principles, comprehensivity, opportunity, rigor, minimization, compartmentation, fault tolerance, proportionality. Seven pretty simple concepts. And I'm going to spend this talk showing you how to apply these in the real world and make your work better and make the things you work on and with more secure. You've seen them all before because all of these come out in things you've already been taught. Raise your hand if you've heard of end-to-end -end encryption. Yeah, exactly. That's comprehensivity. Um, the same thing for having an asset inventory, for doing reconnaissance. Comprehensivity is about taking care of the whole picture. Um, opportunity, information sharing, pen testing. I could go through the whole list, but it's up here and you all know how to read. You've also got it on your ref cards, and I want to get into each of these in depth a little bit while we have the time. I'm going to talk about how we actually use these in practice. So comprehensivity. Um, there was a job I worked a while ago on a massive scientific installation, and by massive I mean that they had a total of six big physical locations across two countries, not to mention all of the smaller researcher access locations. And I'm sitting down with their development team who have a really tough job because in addition to maintaining the software that they develop in as secure a way as they can, um, and this software mediates some communication between some very insecure things and some really delicate ICS and SCADA equipment that will cause them cost them billions of dollars if it goes south. The developers have to do that, but they also have to take a lot of untrusted code written by scientists who are not professional developers and help them get it to a point where it's safe to run in this environment. So they have a pretty tough job. And I'm sitting there with their head of security and with a couple of people from my team talking to these developers and helping figure out what we can help them with. And we start talking about security and they say, oh no, the firewall takes care of that. The firewall takes care of that. Later on, I sent their head of security a cartoon of the magic firewall. <laughs> um, because they just kind of assumed that it wasn't their problem. The issue being a legitimate connection that makes it past the firewall can then poke a hole in absolutely anything else. The idea of comprehensivity is that we don't just look at one part of the picture. We look at the whole picture. Um, so you'll see this in a lot of places, end-to-end -end encryption. If everything's encrypted except in one place, guess where people are going to go after your data? The one place it's not encrypted. Um, opportunity. Opportunity is something that if I have to say the thing that I see fall down the most in the private sector world, the first one's going to be rigor, the second one's going to be minimization, and the third one's going to be opportunity. There are so many things that defenders get as a home court advantage that defenders do not use. So often defenders don't inventory their stuff and make sure that they know what they have. Like seriously, the reconnaissance that the bad guys have to do, that's laborious and it can get you caught 
It's your stuff. You should know what it is. And the people in this room probably know this, but it's a difficult thing to communicate. And using a home court advantage is something that you can explain to people. It's pretty simple. Um, having honey pots and trip wires, but also using partnerships. Um, I don't know how many of you have worked with black hats and script kitties as part of your job working in security. I have. The rate at which they exchange information is incredible. We can have news of a vulnerability leak. And there will be canned exploits that somebody who can barely type their name can run within 12 to 14 hours, sometimes less if it's really juicy. So all of this worrying about skilled attackers, after a while it doesn't really matter if they're skilled because the skilled attackers only save the really juicy stuff for themselves. The rest of this is spread out as far and as fast as they can. Meanwhile, the defenders aren't sharing opportunity, aren't sharing information at nearly this speed. We are dinosaurs in comparison because everybody wants their little silo. They're afraid of what people will find out. It's something I've been working hard to try to change. Rigor. Rigor is a word that scares a lot of tech people because they hear rigor, and yes, rigor often involves policy, and I'll get to that in a minute, but rigor is about making sure that when you do something, you've really done it and you've done it thoroughly. And it's about making sure that you can evolve what you've been doing. So I'm a huge fan of policy and most tech people aren't. And I'm gonna tell you that I'm a fan of policy for two reasons. One is, if any of you have ever played an RPG, having a policy is like having a bureaucrat's true name. No, it's written in the policy, you have to go away now. And they do. It's like magic. No, it says in the, sorry, leadership signed the policy. It says that in an incident, I'm in command. You are welcome to go talk about that at the le next leadership meeting, but right now you need to leave my office and let me get my work done. Or no, it says in the policy that we will take these systems on offline if necessary to remediate a breach. You don't get to come in here and tell my people what they need to do to maintain your uptime when we're in this kind of danger of losing our data. And they just go away. It, it really is. Having a good policy is like having a bureaucrat's true name. It's magic. And it doesn't work on technical people. We're like, that's paper. I'm going to do what I want anyway. So we don't expect it to work, but it really does. Because not everybody's a hacker. Other people listen to policies. Um, the other thing that I love about policy is if you haven't written down how something is done, you can't convince people to fix it later. If you have something and it's being done in a way that doesn't really work and you need to change it, they're going to want a demonstration of exactly what doesn't work and why you think it's not good enough. And when it's not written down, everyone in the room is going to be arguing about the way they think it really went down or the way they think it's really supposed to go down. And you end up in this pit of maybes and different perspectives and nothing ever changes. And that's how you get in these organizational pits where you're sitting in a room and 80% of the people in the room already know what's wrong and no one can get it to change. So part of rigor is writing things down. It also means don't believe what the vendor told you. Test the equipment. Test your own equipment. Never believe vendors. I've had some really great vendors and some really awful ones and you wouldn't know the difference half the time by talking to their salespeople. And I'm really good. I have a psychology background. I can usually catch the charlatans. But here's the problem. The salespeople don't usually know when their own engineers lied to them. So they may not be deceiving you, and they may still be loading, selling you a load of nothing. So test. Rigor means we find out. We don't just assume. So before I jump into what I kind of call the architectural principles, does anybody want to fire questions at me? Because I've been going really fast, so I know I can get you through all of this material in a limited amount of time. No questions? Oh, no book. No questions, no books. You guys better think. Can you give another example of how opportunity plays out besides information sharing? Sure. Um, one of the things I love about opportunity is honeypots. Because a lot of times, um, when I do a lot of work with, for example, ICS and SCADA, your ability to monitor ICS and SCADA is fairly limited because it's so delicate. It's some of the dumbest equipment you could run across. So a lot of times, we'll just place a honeypot on an ICS and SCADA network because we know if that honeypot sees any traffic, the network's been, somebody's managed to pivot their way into that network. Um, and that's, that's the taking, 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 um, 
environment. Right. Okay. Exactly. That's a home court advantage. That that's taking advantage of my environment. Um, and it's it's a really helpful thing. Um, another thing that can be opportunity is. Um, being attached to a university and doing some work with Department of Energy, a lot of the people we work with are in regulated environments and they have to do X, Y, Z amount of training every year for compliance and this and that, and they are bored to tears and they are miserable. Um, if I want to get them interested in actually doing security right, the last thing they want is to sit in another lecture. So I'm like, so I have some information security training you can do, and I set up an exercise where they get to be on a mini red team which they, nobody lets non-technical people be on a red team. I'll let them call up and try to social engineer our own support staff. It's great. They get engaged. They, the opportunity is that they had to have the training requirement met somehow. And they are bored to tears. And I just gave them something that isn't like the trainings they're used to. And now they're thinking about security because I've included them in something that I normally don't. Um, as a matter of fact, there's an old Linux journal article I did, if anybody's ever interested in a copy, about how to use security exercises to really build out security culture in an organization in addition to fixing security problems and beefing up your security process. And one of the things I talk about is getting unexpected people onto the red team so they get a taste of it. It really builds buy-in and it really builds that interest in that belief in the program, and it helps counter the feeling that people are being tested. And that's another great example of opportunity, is winning people over with a process you need to do anyway. So why don't you give that lady a book, Luke? So, <laughs> is there a best practice, or do you find that there are a lot of gaps in mentoring ICS and SCADA equipment? Absolutely. It's it's one of the hardest things to get people to do, um, in part because in a lot of places, the ICS and SCADA equipment isn't handled by the IT department. It's either handled by its own department or in even scarier cases, your mechanical or electrical department who don't know which things are talking to your network. Is there a standard or anything to follow? Or is it still There's not a standard, but if you want to catch me after the talk, I will talk about some of the strategies that we use to work around those problems with different organizations I do control systems in. So Phil, get that guy a book, please, Luke. OK, so minimization. Battle of Thermopylae, how many people know what that is? OK, famous Greek battle. About 300 guys held off a massive army, and historians argue about how massive, but um, great use of opportunity. They diverted a river into a swamp to make that entire area impassable, which meant the only way to come through this pass outside Thermopylae was in a tiny pass between an ocean and a cliff. And it was so narrow you couldn't bring wagons or chariots through. It was barely two men wide. And really fighting, it was almost one man wide. And a very small force with a choke point like that can hold off a very large army because they made their attack surface tiny. And while those 300 men died, their entire city was evacuated and all of their families made it to safety because they held off a massive oncoming army. That's a really good example of minimization. When you have 14 APIs when you only really need two, you're spreading your resources across securing all of those and you don't know where the enemy's coming in. You're trying to monitor all of them. You're trying to make sure that they're all coded in a sane way. You're trying to deal with any problems that crop up with them. If you can condense that to a fewer, more general APIs, that are very tightly designed, all of a sudden you can concentrate your resources. Um, this comes into when you're working in a network as well. How many things need to talk to how many other things? Can we start with a firewall rule that no traffic is going anywhere and then enable things as we need them? It takes some work to profile everything that needs to go on in your network like that, and how minimal you can get it will vary from organization to organization, but the less things that are allowed, the fewer things you need to monitor, the fewer things you need to understand to make things secure, the fewer points of attack there are. Because remember, as defenders, we have the hard job. As defenders, we're trying to deal with the entire scope of what can be attacked. Any attacker only needs one good attack, maybe two. So reducing what's there, why are you holding on to data you don't need? Those are things that can be stolen in a breach. The bigger 
the reward for someone who, who causes a breach for your organization, the higher caliber enemies you have to deal with. Why are you holding social security numbers if you don't need them? I know a lot of companies that hold data just in case. Reducing what you hold is a really powerful technique. Oh, I almost forgot my very favorite minimization example, and I'm going to make you all sit through this even though it makes minimization longer than everything else. When I took over the rescue project for the NTP, or Network Time Protocol Reference Implementation, um, it was a really tough project, and we spent several months just getting to the point where the build system worked without depending on a single particular server that couldn't be relied on, where we had a repository that was in Git as opposed to BitKeeper, which is this proprietary thing with some scary licensing at the time, um, where we had developer access. where we had developer tools that worked so that the code could actually be worked on. And once we got it to this state, we had to hand it on. Um, the original developer didn't want to continue with our work, and he just maintained the status quo with the code base that he already had. And a fork happened. And the new team called NTPSec, I refer to the old one as NTP Classic, took what we'd done, which wasn't any notable ch code changes, and in their first year, they couldn't afford to do any of the big structural changes or bug hunting or things you would normally think that a security problem project needs because they were desperately trying to cope with the code quality. And in that first year, all they did was minim minimization. They removed code that was for hardware that no longer existed. They removed code that was theoretically unreachable that no one had actually removed from the code base. And they removed code that had been supplemented supplanted by other code to do the same job but was still left in the code base and was still reachable. And simply through minimization, and I'm not going to give these people credit for fixing any security vulnerabilities they knew about, they managed to dodge 85% of the security vulnerabilities they hadn't discovered. 85% simply through minimization. And we know this because they forked a code base and the old code base was maintained the same way and they did a year of minimization. And during this time period, a university professor said, oh, NTP's full of holes. I'm going to take a bunch of information security students and pit them against NTP and have them find security vulnerabilities. And she did, and NTPSec dodged 85% or so of them. That's amazing. Minimization is truly powerful. Don't give yourself more to protect than you really need. Compartmentation. Um, I realize this is an awkward word. We spent a lot of time on this one because we had to pick a term that didn't mean anything strange to programmers, to sysadmins, to business people, to lawyers, to military, or to government, or to any of the other audiences that we work with. So whatever word you think is better than this, it upset someone <laughs> or confused them. So this is what we got. But compartmentation is great. Um, when we talk about compartmentation, we mean things that you're familiar with. We mean network segmentation. We mean breaking up your code into discrete parts with clean APIs. We mean, remember when that grandmother of yours or the little old lady in your neighborhood said, don't put all your eggs in one basket? This is what we mean. And this is not done enough in technology today. Um, and there, there are so many examples I could run you through, and I think most of you have seen them before, but I'm, I'm watching things become more monolithic generally because I think that minimization and compartmentation um, balance against each other a little bit. Because as you try to simplify, it's easy to stop compartmentalizing the way you should. But compartmentalizing is important the same way it is for a sinking ship, the same way it is when someone breaks into a system. Do you really want them to break into your WordPress site and suddenly get a hold of your customer database? These probably shouldn't be in the same place. Um, segregating these things away from one another is really important. Um, and it also happens in code because it's not just about the attacker. It's also about us. Um, there's a psychological concept called chunking. There's only so much that a single individual can hold in their working memory and just understand at the same time. And you can put that down and pick up another chunk, but the size of a chunk that a person can handle is finite. 
And there are certain things that people can do, and some people can handle bigger chunks than others, but nobody can handle a chunk of infinite size, and nobody can handle a chunk that is 40,000 lines of code. If you, com if you do compartmentation well, every piece of code that a programmer works on will only directly affect things that are in a chunk the programmer can hold in their head while they're working. And this is something that's a little fluffy and a lot of programmers try to poo-poo away, but psychologists have demonstrated over and over that the quality of our work is higher when the impact of whatever we are doing fits within what we can hold in working memory while we're working. So when we compartment our code so that this function I'm working on is something I can hold in my head, I can understand the whole function while I work on it, and it has a clean API and I understand how it is expected to interact with other things, I don't have to understand all those other things that call that function while I'm working in order to prevent myself from introducing a huge security vulnerability. These vulnerabilities come from somewhere, guys, and let me tell you, it's us, it's programmers, we made them. I will admit I've created them. So thinking about how we design things, not just from the practical level, not just from separating the family jewels into a couple of pots so they don't all get stolen at once, but also to think about how we work on technology and create technology and making ourselves better at our jobs. Fault tolerance. How many of you have ever made it a whole year with nothing going wrong in your life? I, I'm not seeing any hands raised. Me either. My, my hands are down here. And that's because things go wrong. The world is messy, especially the world of information security. Um, even if you have a magic firewall, like the folks on that science project I told you about, it will not protect you from everything. Someday your magic firewall will have a bug in it. Someday the intern will unplug the magic firewall and plug the network cable in on the other side. Something will go wrong. I can't tell you what, but it will go wrong. We try to design systems with multiple fail-safes. We try to create a system in which more than one thing has to go wrong before there's a failure I care about. Um, and this is something that is hard to communicate to the business community a lot of the time because they want to hear we fixed it. And when we learn the language of business risk, this gets easier and we're more likely to get what we need in terms of ensuring fault tolerance. Um, the word resilience is really big here. I try to avoid that word because it has some very specific connotations in specific communities. So depending on what audience you're speaking to, that may, or may not be a sensible word to choose. But fault tolerance is one of those things that when more than one thing has to go wrong, you guys are a lot safer. I'm a lot safer. We're all better off. Um, that can mean that we're checking user input in more than one place. And yes, minimization, you can take this too far. All of these things get balanced against one another. Um, but fault tolerance is a big one, and it's something that we can describe to people in terms of business risk. Um, this will mitigate some of the risk. It is not perfect. This is our last one, and this is our big one. People who are not security people are more scared of us much of the time than we think. Because unfortunately, most of us at least once, probably many times in our careers, we'll walk into a situation with one or more people or an entire organization who have had post-security trauma disorder. I just made that up on stage. But they have met the security people who are just there to say, no, I'm scared of something going wrong, so you can't do that. I don't care how much you need to do it to do your job. And let me tell you, I can make your computer perfectly secure. It'll be great. I'm going to take a sledgehammer. I'm going to break your computer into tiny little bits. I'm going to encase it in cement. And then I'm going to take that once it's dried and drop it to the bottom of the Marianas Trench at the bottom of the ocean. Nobody's ever breaking into that thing. It'll be great, at least not while any of us are alive to care. The problem is you're also not going to get any work done. And this is what a lot of people are afraid of. Proportionality is the principle that counters this. I'm not going to spend $1,000 to keep myself from losing $100. We all accept risk. We all scale what we're doing to the mission at hand. I do different things for life critical applications than I do to protect a student science experiment. Um, and this is something that we really emphasize because while smart security people get it, we constantly work with people who have run into our evil twins. And we have to overcome that every day and we have to communicate that to people every day. 
So I'm going to review the whole set. Am I covering all my bases, comprehensivity? Am I taking advantage of my environment, opportunity? What's correct behavior and how am I ensuring that that's actually what's going on? Rigor? Can this be a smaller target, minimization? Is this made of distinct parts with limited interactions, compartmentation? What happens if this fails, fault tolerance? Proportionality, is this worth it? These seven principles can break down just about anything you work with or on in security, and it's been a great tool for my team when we run into technologies and situations and environments we've never seen before, or when we have to communicate to people who just don't get it yet and need a lot of help getting there. So we have a couple of minutes for Q&A, but since we're running up against the end of the hour here, um, I wanted to put this up just so that you can find all of my information and you know where to go to CACR to get more info there, and we have a table just outside. So I'm happy to take questions, but thanks for listening, and I'm sorry I was a bit of a rabid talker there. So, uh, yeah, the principles are great. What is your recommendation um, applying them to a environment, if, if, like a smaller environment, if the business itself is really kind of following these principles from a security standpoint? How do you, how do you get so I'm usually starting with a couple things at the same time. One is stakeholder education. A lot of stakeholders, especially the non-technical ones, have been told you have to do security, and they haven't been told what it is, only that it's expensive and failure prone, and people will be mad at them if it goes wrong. And that's a really terrifying position to be in when you don't have the knowledge to wrap your head around it. That's part of why we came up with the principles, because something like this little blue book, it's only, I don't know how many pages that is, but it's tiny. And that's something they can digest without being very technical. And it gives them a place to start. And just having a couple meetings about, OK, we're going to make a master information security policy, and we're going to agree on what our priorities are. We're not picking technologies. We're not deciding on funding today. Our first piece of paper is going to say, what are our priorities? What mission are we protecting? What parts of that do we care more about than other parts of that? And who is responsible? And who? what is the decision-making process? And if you can get people to that point, you can start slowly evolving the rest. But getting people to where they feel like there's a structure they can interact with, and they can make progress, and that you understand their priorities. And maybe you want to change their priorities over time, but at least you know where they're starting out. And you can set that up and say, OK, we're going to start from here. We're going to review this annually. But I really start try to start from their mission and their priorities, because one, that's what they care about, so they're more likely to be motivated. And two, so many people start from scare tactics that we have that like post-security trauma disorder. And you really have to fight against the people who've run into our evil twins or heard nasty rumors about our evil twins. So basic education yes, education, patience. Um, and be willing to be incremental where you can afford to be incremental. Because too much too fast does scare people in, in those organizations that are just gun shy or don't get it yet. <laughs>